we're live now at least. There we go. And yes, so here we go. Our next to last uh, hangout uh, for the online game theory class. As usual, we have uh, a bunch of participants from uh, around the world, and most of the time we'll devote it for a conversation with them. Um, the um, I, I guess we have to start um, first with uh, an apology. Um, we sent reminders about the Hangout, and they were all right, except one of them by mistake mentioned 10 a.m. Pacific rather than the correct 8 a.m. And so those, for some reason, were mislaid by that. We apologize, but obviously it will be on YouTube to watch. The other thing uh, I guess we have to say uh, is to send our condolences to one of the students in class who passed away this week. Um, and we send our condolences to his, his family. Um, and um, that's about all we can say right now. Um, so um, there are many things that uh, popped up during the week. Most of them were taken care of, a lot of them mechanical by nature, certain mistakes and errors you caught, thank you. And we think we've corrected the ones that, that did pop up. Um, maybe one or two things that uh, worth discussing. Uh, there were some questions about the sequencing of things and Bayesian games versus uh, coalitional game theory. Matt, do you want to address this? Oh, sure. I, I think the uh, syllabus has, and, and last week we, we mentioned Bayesian games would be coming this week, and now coalition games were posted. So uh, we had uh, just a, a mix-up in the syllabus listing. Um, but Bayesian games will be coming uh, this this week, so Sunday at midnight, and that'll be our last subject before the final exam. So uh, that'll be coming next week. Uh, Kevin, uh, any anything you wanted to add? Uh, no, thank you. Uh, I guess this week we play. You know, where in the world is uh, the professor? Uh, so. I guess, Kevin, it's your turn to be in some exotic locale, isn't it? Yeah, I'm in uh, Tel Aviv right now, in, uh, visiting Tel Aviv University. And obviously, that third world country doesn't have adequate uh, webcams available, but that's OK. Um, Sadly, it's true. What can I say? Um, the uh, Let's see. Um, there were several questions on the forum of, 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 of that we've discussed in, in the past of the general form, how do we apply game theory to X? And I won't be surprised if you know we have some of these in the discussions now. Let me just say that some of these, several of these questions were uh, best uh, addressed in the context of Bayesian games, or games of incomplete information that, as Matt said, we'll be discussing next week. Uh, and um, uh, so we'll delay discussion. For example, uh, um, uh, application to poker, an interesting application domain. But we'll uh, probably best uh, discuss it next week. We'll announce the time correctly. Uh, uh, and so uh, we can, you can all join next week. And also, we will be announcing, uh, as we said, the next iteration of this class and the follow-up advanced class. We'll also do all of this online in email to the class, as well as on the class uh, web page. So maybe without uh, further delay, let's start the conversation going. Let's start with uh, Yuang Hu. Please unmute your mic and tell uh, us a little bit about Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, I'm Yu Huang Hu. I'm from Malaysia. Uh, now I'm studying artificial intelligence uh, under uh, my, my department. And now I'm currently working on the so-called quantum-inspired decision-making uh, model. Uh, it's, it's something like uh, we, we are trying to produce human-like decision, uh, not the machine-like decision, uh, to improve the human-machine interaction. 
Very good. Uh, is there a game theoretic uh, issue you wanted to bring up? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, basically, uh, uh, like the uh, it, uh, when people make, make a decision, it's just like the game theory, uh, but it's not. Uh, but it's not like the how the game theory uh, represents this. Uh, it's like a uh, game theory is always want to find the best solution of all these games. But the, uh, actually, the human being, the uh, sometimes they don't care anymore about that. Uh, so uh, we found that our approach can uh, our approach can uh, can build a very well results uh, rather than other inference uh, effects. Uh, so I think I think that, that that's all I. I want to share here, I think. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you very good. much, a very important topic. Um, uh, please do re-mute your mic, Kevin or Matt, did you want to say a word about bounded rationality? Well, I, I'll actually say one thing that just didn't, that came to mind in listening to this. The, there was actually, uh, Richard McKelvey at Caltech a number of years ago ran a series of experiments and the experiments were to have a whole series of different games played by humans and also you could send in a program that you would try to what you what the intention of the program was to imitate a human so you wanted to look as close to human as possible and if you uh, managed to do this uh, he had there were other people sending programs in to try and detect which were humans and which were programs. Um, it, it turns out it's very difficult to, to act like a human. So it's not easy to write a program which even with a very simple game looks like a human would play. So humans are obviously doing things that are, are well beyond some of what game theory is incorporating at this point in time and it's not, uh, it's, it's a very difficult problem to emulate humans or to figure out exactly what humans think of when they look at games. So a great topic and uh, one that people are working on. Kevin, anything yeah, you I wanted to add? add? That, uh, sorry, yeah. Um, I should add that James Wright, who's uh, one of our TAs in the class, is actually doing his PhD on predicting the way that humans play games. Uh, I think he's done some, some pretty impressive work in uh, comparing the quality of different behavioral game theory models and uh, uh, improving on some of these models, so uh, you should ask him about this in the forums if you'd like to learn more. I'll second that. It's very interesting work. All right. Uh, uh, Victor Fernandez, the floor is yours. Uh, uh, I have a very simple question, I think. Uh, uh, but, I, but, I, uh, but I also have a question. Where are you from? Tell us about yourself. All right, I am from Brazil, and I am from Paulo, the city of São Paulo, and uh, I am a graduate from business administration. And I am trying to use game theory in some business, uh, and what I want to know, and it's it's kind of how can we uh, assume or, or predict if an Nash equilibrium when we are talking about some several companies to compete each other to go to another country. Do you know what I mean? I found it a little hard to hear what, what Victor is saying. Matt and Kevin, could you hear him better than I did? I uh, just, I missed the last part. Maybe he could repeat. Uh, when uh, I'm looking for several other companies who want to go to another country, they compete each other and against another other companies in, the, in that country. So I think in some case that could be a net equilibrium for some companies uh, when you think the payoffs to go there or the, the payoff to fight against others. And it's very hard to identify when that happened or not. So uh, if, if you can tell me something and how do you predict or how do you confirm if that is a net equilibrium when you have uh, several companies competing each other. I, I, I'm, uh, 
near as I can tell, it's a question about the game theory of coalitional build, uh, building in a competitive setting among companies. I, is this also your understanding of the question, Kevin? I, or think, they, I think they are more competing than coalition, but is that, is that the question? I'm sorry, I just I, I wonder if we word. could ask Victor to type his question and return to him uh, after another person speaks, because I, I can't make out anything that he's saying. Okay, let's do this. We'll, we'll try to go back to you. We're just, it's a little hard to hear you. Uh, maybe right. you can maybe you can also type your question in the chat, okay. and uh, that would be a good idea. Okay. In the meanwhile, please mute your mic, and we'll go to your almost namesake, Victor Delgado. Please unmute. Tell us about yourself. Hi. Can you hear me? Very well. Um, I'm Victor from Belo Horizonte, Brazil. And I'm working with uh, demography uh, and game theory. I'm actually doing my PhD on this area and applying this to uh, uh, fields, uh, game theory, and also uh, demography. And my question is about the relation, if there is any relation. Uh, between Pareto concept and the enforceable concept. Uh, is there a, any relation about these two topics? Because uh, I, I think that is, is very uh, enforceable if we have a repeated game with, uh, with uh, a Pareto, Pareto cell, a Pareto equilibrium. We can um, force the equilibrium to, to there, I think. Is there any relation between this, these two kinds of topics? Okay, so um, so the question is, if you, you recall our discussion of repeated games, um, in a repeated game there is uh, the um, folk theorem speak about uh, the notion of what strategies are enforceable uh, is essentially by uh, uh, by having the uh, uh, the other players uh, punish you if you don't follow the strategy, and that leads to some set of outcomes. And then there are the Pareto efficient outcomes, and there's a question about the whether those two sets of outcomes is there are, are related in one way or another. Am I did I get the question correctly? Yeah. That's it. Okay. Uh, either Matt or, or Kevin. Oh uh, sure, I'll jump in. Uh, so it seems to me that uh Pareto efficient outcomes uh, may not be enforceable for one of the players. Because I uh, imagine an outcome where one person is getting the very best payoff possible for them and uh, the other pay player is getting something really terrible, uh, which is uh, less than their min-max value. Uh, that would be a pretty efficient outcome if it's the very biggest possible payoff for, for the one player. Um, so, so that should make you see that it's possible to be pretty efficient and not be enforceable. Mm, okay. uh, I'm doing that off the top of my head, so let's see if the others agree with me. But that, that's what I think. <laughs> well, it's, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I think Kevin Kevin's correct. I mean, uh, there 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 are situations when some games where they can coincide, but uh, not generally. So it, 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 what's enforceable might not be Pareto efficient. Indeed. Not always. So right. not 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 on this call, but it'll be interesting, I think, for you to see uh, if your the class of games that you are considering in modeling the demographic situation have special properties that you can exploit. But not not on this call. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Please remute, and we'll go to Iva. Please unmute and introduce yourself. Eva. Eva, oh, I'm sorry. You told me before. Uh, I am on the east coast in of the U.S. in Georgia, and my question is 
pretty general and it has to do with the it's an application question like you talked about before and i'm a business student and i we did some game theory in my strategic class and strategic management and uh, i've seen it used to model oligopolies and um, like whether to enter the market or not or whether it's like a pricing model and how to react to competitions and things like that. I was just wondering how you guys have uh, experienced game theory used practically to make decisions in business. Fair question. Um, you know, the we, we, I think every call we make the caveat there's always a gap between the clean theory uh, in, in game theory and, and applications, but nonetheless, uh, it seems like game theory finds itself in many applications. Um, Matt, you're not quite in the business school, but you're very close. Uh, yeah, I, I, sure. I, I think, you know, uh, probably all of us have had different uh, consulting arrangements with with companies and game theory plays some part in that and, and uh, with a, I, I can't name particular companies but I, I can say that that often in these situations what's useful to them is not necessarily very specific predictions about how they should act uh, using a, a model of a game in a particular market but getting them to think carefully about their competitors, what their competitors might be doing, what payoffs might look like, um, whether they should be thinking about the long run or the short run. So a lot of the basic concepts that we've been talking about in terms of game theory, we're making them very formal and specific and, and looking at, at, at details in the course. But for them, it's, it's just making sure that they have everything in mind and understand that their competitor might react to how they're going to act and, and they shouldn't take that as a static situation and, and once you start moving down that road it becomes much clearer how they should act and, and I think uh, you know forming strategies for companies involves game theoretic thinking um, even though they might not write down an extensive form game and solve it so it's, it's still a very useful tool especially in pricing decisions when the what you know should they enter a market what might happen if they enter a market what are the different possibilities do they have an advantage what kinds of advantage do they have should they be moving first should they be moving later all the kinds of questions that we're asking in the course are ones that they should be thinking about. Kevin? Uh, I don't know if I have anything to add to that. I think we've, uh, in previous calls, uh, uh, talked in general about this idea that, uh, that game theory offers something useful to practitioners as a way of thinking, uh, even in cases where the, the, the model isn't exactly right. Um, maybe I should make a plug for mechanism design, which is uh, a kind of an application of game theory where we maybe uh, in practice do think a little bit more crisply about game theoretic assumptions. Uh, that's something that uh, you'll hear more about in our uh, second offering, uh, our, our second game theory course that we'll be offering in a few months. Uh, so let me second both of those uh, responses and also add that the one perhaps extreme case where you see game theory applied most directly is when all the players are are game theorists, or at least advised by game theorists. Uh, and there's a famous, I think we mentioned in the past, uh, that sounds like a joke, but actually serious statement that uh, game theory is an excellent model of how game theorists uh, behave. And uh, we sort of saw it in the um, in the uh, uh, spectrum auctions where there were relatively small set of players, each advised by uh, economists and game theorists. And in that setting, in fact, you saw that the game theoretic model tracked uh, quite closely what happened in practice. So thanks for the question. Uh, Eva, got it right this time. Please mute your mic and we'll move on to Daniela. Please introduce yourself. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Daniela. I'm from Portugal and right now I'm studying computer science, uh, in particular uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, last week there was a question about risk aversion 
uh, that was answered and there are paradoxes such as Ellsberg paradox and Ellis paradox uh, and my my question is if they can be explained considering a uh, risk uh, or ambiguity a version profile in the players um. I'm not sure I completely got. Uh, so you you correctly point to the uh, the, the no paradoxes. Um, um, I, I guess uh, Matt, Matt, before I ask for clarification, Matt or Kevin, maybe uh, you 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 understood the question better than me and can answer it. But I can take a stab at it. I, I, um, so for people that don't know what the LA and and Ellsberg paradoxes are, they are situations where uh, faced with with actual decisions people have tended not to act in ways that are consistent with maximizing the expected utilities and so the question seems to be if if we think that people might behave that way then then what is what does game theory have to say about that and I think that the you know you can view a lot of what's going on in the course as a, a starting point and moving out from that means that now if, if we assume that people might not have a full understanding of the game and some things might be ambiguous to them, maybe they don't know about actions, maybe they know they don't know about actions and so forth, how should they behave? Um, that's an important question. It, it's one that uh, people are looking at. So there, there are several recent articles on on how to model games with ambiguity. Um, it's it's you know, there, there's no easy answer to that. It, it makes things very complicated to analyze, but interesting. Uh, so, so indeed, it's it's an important question, and one that needs to be taken into account. Daniela, did this answer your question? Um, yes, <laughs> more uh, more or less. <laughs> Is there any follow-up question you want to have? Or clarification. Uh, mm. No, <laughs> I don't uh, think so. Okay, that's okay, fair enough. Well, let, me, let, me, uh, let me add something to, to this uh, discussion, if I might. Um, it, uh, th there sort of are two different senses in which um, human behavior uh, fails to kind of fall within game theoretic models. Uh, the first is when people um, are, are really behaving in a sense that, that is really inconsistent with sort of any utility function, it, it, in, in some sense they're really acting against any sensible interest that they might have. Uh, and the, in these cases, we, I think, would be most tempted to say that people are just doing something wrong. And if they uh, could, could be kind of educated about what they're doing, they should realize that this is just not in their interest. And, and really, uh, maybe we want to model it so we know how to reason about such people, but really it's just kind of a mistake. Um, so the other kind of thing that uh, we might be interested in is cases where our model just fails to capture something very reasonable about the way that people think. So risk aversion is an example of that, where uh, if I just sort of identify money with utility, then I would be saying that you ought to be happy with, say, gambles where half the time you win a million dollars and half the time you lose a million dollars, and really you wouldn't be happy with that gamble, and that's actually something very sensible for you to feel that way. Uh, because it would be devastating for you to, to be in debt by a million dollars, and it, it's such a horrible thing that, that really your, um, your risk attitude uh, isn't linear. Your, your utility for money curve isn't linear. So uh, some of these kinds of paradoxical situations can be explained by kind of enriching the model, and others of them really just end up looking like places where people are doing something wrong. Okay. Thank, uh, thanks. <laughs> Well, if I can't hear you. Yoav, I think you might be speaking, but muted. Thank you. I was muted. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, Daniela, thank you. Please mute your mic. And Andres, uh, your turn. Please unmute and introduce yourself. Uh, hi. Can you hear me? 
We can hear you as well as the background noises. <laughs> um, sorry. Um, my name is Felipe Leon. I'm a student of computer science in the National University of Colombia. Um, we are taking a course of um, operations research. And our teacher, he encouraged us to take this course of game theory. Um, and this course is going to be one of the grades of our course of operations research. But sadly, we started a week ago. So this Monday, we start taking this course. And we are aware that there last only three weeks for finishing this. The, the game theory course. So um, our teacher uh, he wanted to ask if you are going to repeat this course uh, before May. That it's when we finish our academic period. Okay. Um, I'm uh, first of all I'm very glad that the course is useful uh, to you there. We will be repeating it. On approximately April 1st, this course will start again, not on Coursera, but we will announce both on our website, the game theory class.org, as well as the email list, the exact URL where, uh, to go to. And uh, following the course, there will be also a, uh, an advanced course uh, with advanced topics in the same location. Okay? We hope to see you there then. It's, sorry, I couldn't hear you uh, really good on the last part. So, uh, you are saying that the course is not going to be on Coursera? Uh, yeah, the next time we will teach this class, which will be at the beginning of April, will not be on Coursera. It will be on a Stanford website, and we will be announcing exactly the URL. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Please mute your mic again, Andres, and we'll go to Ajinkya. Please introduce okay. yourself. Um, hello, I'm, Ajink I'm Ajinkya Dahale from uh, Ahmedabad. I'm currently doing my final. I'm currently in my final year of uh, B.Tech in Mechanical Engineering from IIT Gandhi Nagar. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Now we can, yes. Hello? Yes, we heard the introduction. Yeah. Welcome. Uh, can you hear me? Do you have a topic you want to yeah. discuss? So, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, so, we, uh, this week we talked about uh, the concept of a core, right? Which uh, is kind of giving stable solu stable solution uh, but i could not understand one thing how would the non veto players agree to uh, form the collision when they are not getting any payoffs <laughs> hello <coughs> yeah sorry so um, you're asking okay you you understand what are the um, what are the imputations that lie in the core, but you don't understand why one of them will be selected over the others? Is that correct? Uh, oh, not exactly. It's like I'm asking uh, in the in the solution to the core, we find that we do not give any payoffs to uh, the non-veto players. So, what, why would they form a collision? Okay. Um, again, we speak about veto pair. We used to speak about simple games. Um, Kevin, do you want to take this or Matt? Uh, either way. So I, I guess you know that um, when when we think about uh, veto players, what it does mean, you know, I, I think when we represent a coalitional game. It, it's, it's giving us some idea of power that the players have, right? So the imputation tells us who can do what. And it's not modeled explicitly, 
but what it does say is that the the other players basically just don't have any power, and and uh, the the core is picking up the fact that they can be uh, uh, you you don't have to give them anything. The other players have control essentially, and you know whether in fact uh, in practice, if you wanted to to look at how an international agreement works when one country is, is sitting with all the power, they might give a small amount to another to another country. So the you know the predictions of the of the core are, are very stark. Um, they go to an extreme, but the, they're capturing a, a power imbalance and. And the difference between veto players and non-veto players in a simple game is, is extreme. Um, okay. That did that answer, answer your question? Adrika, yes, did that answer of... your question? Yes. Wonderful. Okay. Um, I guess uh, we had one question by Vitor who uh, could not hear or uh, us and we could not hear him. Let me see if I can read it. I study business and my focus is internationalization. So when several oh, where did it go? When several companies are trying to go to another country, they are competing against each other and against the companies that were already there. So I think in many cases the national equilibrium appears but how do how can I identify if that is true or not? And Victor, Victor I see, can actually hear us even though we cannot hear him. Um, so I guess I you know I guess um, it's a game like any other game, and um, in order to I identify a national equilibrium, we need to to set up the model. Um, uh, I don't know that the situation that you're describing makes the Nash prediction any more or less realistic than situations that are purely domestic as opposed to international. Uh, I don't think it does. Uh, but uh, as far as identifying whether the prediction of game theory hold there, uh, the, the, that really is a, uh, you need to look at the exact model. Uh, and do econometric work and, and, and see if the data holds up. Um, but I'll invite uh, Kevin or Matt to chime in. Uh, sure. I mean, in general, we should avoid uh, feeling like the, the Nash prediction is some kind of magical statement about the world, that, that people will somehow find themselves in a Nash equilibrium come what may. Uh, really, what, what what's being said is that players uh, either will be in a Nash equilibrium or somebody will be doing something wrong. Somebody will feel like, in retrospect, they wish they were doing something differently. So um, in situations that are, are repeated or situations where people are well informed about each other, we, we might think it's more likely that a Nash equilibrium would arise. Um, in, in situations uh, that occur only once or where people are not well informed, we might imagine that they would miscoordinate and not be in a Nash equilibrium. And in that case, uh, all we're saying is that uh, once they realize how everyone plays the game, somebody would uh, would regret what they did and would wish that they had done something else. So, so the Nash equilibrium really is just kind of that situation where nobody feels any regret about what happened. Uh, but that doesn't mean somehow it's it's always bound to happen. That that you really would have to know by by studying your particular problem. Uh, we're about to finish. Matt, you get the final word. Sure. I, let me just uh, echo a little bit of what Kevin said, and, and also to point out that when you look at these kinds of situations, you know, repetition is is important. So companies are really playing repeated games, and uh, and that that very much shapes the way they think and and the way that you might want to analyze it. So I don't think you want to think of just a static one-shot game. You might want to be thinking about these these companies interacting over time and and trying to ask uh, how they might behave. And, and as Kevin points out. They might regret how they behave. They might not play Nash Equilibrium or, or Subgame Perfect, but uh, they might. Um, it's still useful to think that way. All right, uh, we're just about done. Uh, I want to once again first apologize for the one um, uh, one notice that misstated the start of this uh, broadcast. Next week uh, we will do our final broadcast. We'll do something a little different this time. 
um, and uh, should be interesting. Uh, and uh, the uh, I'll just end again by uh, sending our condolences to the family of the student who passed away last week. Goodbye, everybody. See you next week.